Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. At Grace Community Church, we are committed to five biblical priorities for ministry. Christ-centered preaching. Passionate worship. Fervent prayer. Courageous evangelism. Purposeful disciple-making. May God enable us by His Spirit to live out these distinctives for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Well, I invite you this morning to go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. This is a wonderful day in the life of our church. Don't you love when babies are born? Ken, huh? Yeah, all right. Good to have Ken back. Cass- Cassidy's at home, probably making sure. Little Raylan is paying attention right now. Come on, wake up. Oh, praise the Lord. Isn't it? It's joyous. We got to make that announcement a few weeks back. There's new life and all the blessings and all the challenges that come along with this into a family and into a church family. So whether it's new life through birth or an adoption into a family, this is bringing a life into a family, giving a name, sharing a family, saying you belong to us, that is worth rejoicing over. It's absolutely glorious. And everything, you just ask Ken in case you've forgotten if you're a parent, everything changes, right? Your whole schedule and life changes. And this is one of the beautiful elements of being married and having children is it drives us, if you allow the process that God has ordained from self-centered living, I like this, I want this, I'll do this here, I'll do this there. And a child comes along and it shows us how desperately selfish we are and how much glory is in serving and depending on our Heavenly Father to supply what we none of us absolutely have. But He has what we need. And so it teaches us something. And so whether that's in your own family or whether that's in a church family, it drives us to an absolute dependence on the Lord for every stage, every season of life. We can't ever, Lord, I got it, it's on autopilot. No, no. Every day we spend, Lord, we need you. And we trust you, but it's, it's absolutely joyous. Now, the early church, and this is the context to our study today, the early church was experienced growth by the thousands. All right, so just imagine some have twins, some triplets, quadruplets, on up. Imagine if one baby changes your world, what is it to have two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, everything. You're completely, I help. I'm drowning in all that comes with babies here. I have to have help. The early church was growing by thousands. They were overwhelmed and it was wonderful and it's joyous and it's amazing and it's thousands of people. How do we shepherd all of these people? How do we make disciples of all of these people? How do we obey the Lord and teach them to obey everything that he's commanded us? Ah, That's Acts chapter 6. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, 
It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God. This is a helpful passage to us as we come to this important service in the life and history of our church and in ministry and steps that we are intentionally taking to glorify God and be good to all, for all peoples with the gospel. This is what we can expect, all right? Any great commission church, there's five expectations that we see from Acts chapter 6, these seven verses. There's five expectations. If a church is going to, Lord, you have given us a great commission, help us to be obedient and carry out this mission, then number one, expect this. The Lord will build his church. The Lord will build his church. He promised this. And the early church is realizing this. They're experiencing, Jesus said he was going to do this. And there are people every day coming to faith in Christ and being baptized. This is incredible. Jesus said he was going to, why are we surprised? Do we ever read our Bibles and think, well, that was nice for them. But this is Richmond. This is what Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you, speaking to Peter, and on this rock, Peter, a little small Cephas, small Petros, on this rock, this truth, not on Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm telling you, Peter, I'm going to build my church on this truth, on the gospel, on me, and you're going to see it. The earlier church experienced all of the life and growth, and it was all by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was doing exactly what he promised to do. John Calvin says it this way. He says, we ought to wish for nothing more than that God would increase his church and gather together many on every side unto his people. So those who, that's John Calvin, as in Calvinism. So people who take Calvinism to say, if God will save people, let them save people, they didn't pay attention to what Calvin said himself. I know God is sovereign, just like Paul knew. There's people in Corinth, I'm going to go share the gospel because he's going to do the work he promised to do. There's the heart of the gospel is I can go with confidence, you can go with confidence that if we present the gospel, the Lord will awaken people like he did Lazarus from death. He will awaken people by his word with the word from spiritual death and spiritual blindness and he will give them sight and he will give them life. He'll take out that stone heart and he'll put in a heart that beats for righteousness and Christ and the church and the mission and the word of God. That's what God does. So what's the context here? Acts chapter 2, Peter preached. The power of the Holy Spirit came on him, assembled all of those people, and that day 3,000 were added. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3, Peter and John, they healed a certain lame man born from birth. He had never walked, and there he sat at the temple. And they're like, we don't have any wealth, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And that guy's leaping. Large crowd gathered, and here comes the priests the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, and they have him arrested in chapter 4. And out of that, about 5,000 men came to believe. Backfired. That didn't go well. They assembled a crowd, and they preached Christ, and 5,000 hear the word and believe and come 
to faith in Jesus Christ. In Acts 4, Peter and John, they're set before the Sanhedrin, and Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He preaches Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. The hope of the world, his name is Jesus, that by in him there's no salvation in any other name but Jesus, by whom we must be saved. The council, they're sitting there and they're watching this unfold and they're saying, we recognize something in these guys. Jesus is missing now wherever he went, he ascended, but these guys are just like Jesus. That was the testimony. That's how it began to start to, these are little Christs, these little Christians, these little Christs as a, as a slur. The church didn't come up with that name for themselves. You will call us Christians. No, that was actually meant as sarcasm to them, as hurtful to them, derogatory to them. The council charged them in chapter 4, don't, don't speak or teach in this name anymore. We, we command you. After all, we're the council. And that's when they say, well, whether we should obey God or men, maybe that's out. The verdict isn't in for you, but for us, we're going to obey God. We're not going to bow to you. Acts chapter 5, the church experiences an internal roadblock. Ananias and Sapphira, at the end of chapter 4, Barnabas sells a property, he comes in and says, here, this is a large gift and the church's, the needs are met and it's wonderful. And Ananias and Sapphira are like, whoa, you know, we got some extra property, we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to use it, let's sell it. Hey, let's give the money to the Lord. And however they concocted their plan, they came in saying, here's the whole amount of the property. And that wasn't true. And he lied. And Peter says to Ananias, what? you haven't lied to, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You haven't lied to a man. You've lied to God. And he died. And then Sapphira shows up about three hours later. I'm not going to go down that, you know, the lady's showing up a little bit later. And she says the same thing. And Peter's looking at her saying, you're really going down this road? The, the, feet, the, the guys are coming back from burying your husband and now they're going to bury you. This is an internal attack on the church, just lying. Just being a hypocrite. How does God feel about that? At the inauguration of his church, then people realized we are worshiping a God who is real and alive. And just like we read the, the, the accounts in the Old Testament, when Eli's sons offered a profane fire in the inauguration of the temple, of the, of the, of the tabernacle, and the Lord struck them, he is not to be messed with or ignored, or dismissed. He is not the man upstairs. He is the God who spoke all galaxies into existence. Amen. And there was great fear, and people realized this is legit. They're not in there just going through some religious things. They're worshiping the living God. Don't mess around there. He sees all, knows all, and his love is great. Well, the church continued to grow. They were arrested. The angel of the Lord shows up. Hey, get out of jail free. Now go back and preach again. And they did. They, they call for him out of, the, out of the prison. Go get him. We're going to bring him to the council now. Like, hey, actually, they're not here. Well, where are they? How'd you lose them? Where are they? They're actually back where we found them and arrested them, preaching again. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do with this group? So the council found them. Chapter 5, verse 40, they beat them, they questioned them, don't do this anymore, there's more beatings where this came from. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And what's the outcome? Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. They leave, the, they leave this, this horrific happening. Whoa! We're suffering the Lord. Is, he is using us for his glory. And then the chapter 6 unfolds in those days. When all of this has happened, all of this is going on, there's all of this conflict in these days when the disciples were increasing in number. Discipleship was a top priority in the church. The growth was exponential. What are we going to do with all of these people? 
Because when somebody came to faith and they said, Jesus is Lord, immediately they're at odds with the Roman government because the Roman citizens, the loyal, faithful citizens said, Caesar is Lord. Those who were brought up in Judaism, they say, hear, O Israel, hear the Lord our God is one, and they rejected Jesus. And so and now there's this group of people that are immediately ostracized from the political community. They're immediately ostracized from their religious community, just as some of you have been when you came to fi- faith in Christ and you were put out of the religious tradition. You were brought up and if you felt that, that. But why would you do that? Because Jesus is alive, and this is what he said, and this is the gospel, and it's our desperate, our most important need. And they, it's in these days. So number one, the Lord will build his church. Number two, Satan will attack the mission-minded church. Satan will attack the mission-minded church. We can just write it down. This is, this is the game plan. Satan will attack the mission-minded church. If there is a church that is off mission and is simply existing for personal preferences or the common cultural agenda, Satan doesn't have to do anything with that church. They're in self-destruct mode. <laughs> They're doing themselves in. But a church that says, Lord, will you help us to be on mission? Will you help us to be faithful to your word? Will you use us for your glory here and around the world? Now that's a church that can expect conflict in marriages. Sometimes I've heard of this happening on the way to church. Things can be difficult, you know? And like, it's just, it, it, it sometimes has been said reportedly that this could happen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not your spouse There's a spiritual battle and we're gathering together to sing the praises of our king. Who do you think is going to object to that? You can't sleep the night before and all the struggle that goes on as we try to prepare our hearts for gathering for this rehearsal for heaven. If we're off mission, come one, come all, doesn't matter anyway. You're asleep in the light. So we see in this text, beware of external persecution. We looked at some of those accounts. Satan tried to, he tried to stop the church and he failed on every one of those accounts. It's an obvious enemy. So when you have an obvious enemy, it unites a team together. You put a group that's struggling a little bit into a battle, they got to tighten up quickly or they're done. You put a team together and you watch from the sidelines. Are they working together as a team or are they starting starting to self-destruct? If they begin to have internal conflict, there's a problem and the other team just needs to not make any mistakes. So this obvious enemy is external. We're not confused. They don't love Jesus. They don't love the word. They don't love the church. So yeah, beware of that. But this is more important, this this second one here, letter B, beware of internal friction. Internal friction. Here's the subtle attack that often divides believers. And it's often, it starts out with friction. It's not really a huge conflict. It's just a little bit of getting bristled the wrong way. Somebody's personality just gets under your skin. How they do certain things in ministry just kind of bothers you. You're, you kind of, we can get into a myopic view of this is what I do, this is what I, and you start to get tunnel vision. And there's just friction. We're not sensitive to people around us. We're not sensitive to what's best for my family. How do I serve my family? But we become hypersensitive of what do I want? What is important to me? What is the way that I like to do whatever, fill in the blank? And if everybody doesn't do it that way, then I'll be bothered by you. And it just starts out like friction, but it ends up in division because it wasn't addressed when it was small. It wasn't seen, it wasn't observed for what it genuinely was, and it's really not your problem. It's really, oftentimes it's my issue, and I'm imposing it on you instead of just dealing with it internally before the Lord. Satan's attack was aimed at dividing the members. We've looked at this before. The complaint came from the Hellenists. Hey, what's going on? You're you're, you're neglecting our widows. The daily food, they're going to die without food. And, And what's being done? How are you not taking care of them? These are Hebrews 
The Hebrews were raised in Israel, so they spoke Hebrew, they did all the traditions, and then there were the people that came from all of, you know, we've studied the time when exile, and then they came back and they intermarried with other nations, and they didn't speak the language, they didn't do all the things, they didn't know all the history. You've, been, you've ever been there where someone's like, oh, I guess you had to be there? You know, where, where you go to someone else's reunion, and they're talking about all the good times and the good memories, and you're like, oh, I don't know any of it. That's these Hellenists. And so they're looked down upon. They're second-class Christians at this point. They're, you know, we're the real Christians, and you guys, well, we'll you know, make room for you somewhere sometime, maybe. There's racial, kind of racism here, undertones. We're better than you. We're different than you. You're different than us. They experience scorn from the Hebrews. But what does the gospel do in those situations? Why does this constantly foment in our nation of let, let, it's, it's dying out and people are getting along, so let's bring it back up and let's, let's stir it all up again against the, the, all the different ethnicities? Well, the gospel handles that. Galatians 3.26, Paul writes, and we studied this in our study of Galatians, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, that's a dry baptism, that is the Holy Spirit baptism, the moment that you're converted, you have put on Christ, then verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All of those lines that we make much of, the gospel diminishes. I've been in India where people before coming to faith in Christ would have never shared a meal together from high class to low class. And in Christ, they eat together at the same table. I've watched people serving all these different classes in Christ, serving a meal and not knowing what is going on here. This is strange. This is foreign. This is the gospel. Just because I'm from America and my skin is... That doesn't make me worth any more in the sight of Christ and for the cause of the gospel than the lowest class, the lowest in, in resources on, on the planet anywhere. If they're in Christ, they're my brother. They're my sister. We're equal. That's what he's saying. He's not talking about responsibilities in the church, pastors. All of that is perversion and, and misinterpretation of this text. Paul has an aim. In Christ, we are part of the family of God and there's no second-class Christians. Period. And if you are in Christ, and if you are Christ, verse 29, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. How'd we get in there? We were grafted in, Romans 9, 10, and 11. We don't deserve to be here. This good and gracious king that came through the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we don't deserve to be part of this family. And he graciously forgave me my treason. And if you're in Christ, he wiped away your treason against him through the blood of his son. That's how I'm in here. That's how you're in here. Or that's how you can be brought in here. This is the gospel. So Satan is here attacking the church. He's trying to divert the church leaders. Even if they, you know, however they handle the thing, if we can get the church leaders away from their commitment to the word, that's a win. So number three. Leadership of the church must move forward in wisdom. And this is important to not get paralyzed and get stuck and get stopped and we don't know what to do, so we're just stuck. The leadership, they knew we cannot take this out of drive. We've got to change the wheel, tires. We've got to do this driving. We're not going to put it in park. The mission is going forward, and we have to figure out how to adapt and address the problem and deal with it and stay on mission. Keep moving. But it has to be done in wisdom, not just, oh, well, whatever, you know, let's just keep doing it and just, you know, driving away with ignorance. No, no, no. So how is this done? Well, we see the example from the apostles. Identify the need accurately. That's what it had to be. What is the true need here? When needs are presented, it isn't always that just handing someone money solves the problem. 
They, they keep making bad decisions and finances, and then they say, hey, can you help me? Here, here's some more money. Have you solved the problem? Probably not. So there requires wisdom. Identifying the need accurately. Here's where the 12, the apostles, that is their title. They're the leaders of the congregation. They didn't lord it over the congregation. They listened to the congregation. They cared about the congregation. They called the con congregation together, and then they addressed the need. They addressed it spiritually. They dealt with it biblically. They addressed the need, the problem, from a spiritual perspective. That's what church leaders are to do. It's not just to hear somebody, hey, pastor, let's start this ministry. Oh, okay, let's start that ministry. Hey, what if we do this over here? Okay, let's run over there, everybody. Oh, never mind. Oh, run over here. And how many times, maybe you could search your own heart, when we're saying, hey, there's needs in ministry. Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. But over here, let's do this. And over here, let's do that. And sometimes it's important there is something to be done, but the congregation needs to follow the shepherding of the elders. What are we already committed to that needs to be fully staffed, fully cared for, and then we grow from there and we prayerfully consider other options and other opportunities. But let's handle well everything that's in our care as we move forward. Address the problem spiritually. They had a job to do. Well, we can't say, um, okay, Sunday's coming. You know, the Lord's Day is coming, but serving a meal Monday, serving a meal Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday. Somebody's got to get sister so-and-so the meal <sighs> Sunday. It's tomorrow. So they were committed to address this problem spiritually and let her see to stay on mission intentionally. They chose to serve the word while others served tables. And therefore the need was met, the daily need, and man's greatest need was met. Everybody is cared for in this situation. Opportunities arose for people to serve. Like, Stephen, you, you, want, you want me to serve? Yep. So the apostle said, here's how we're going to do this. Give us capable and qualified men. These men need to be believers. They've got to be disciples. They've got to be part of the church. Okay, so how we go about serving is it's church members. We know who they are. They're identified. We know them. We develop relationships with them. Why? Because we're entrusted with children and, and their stewardship of all things. So we know one another. We're committed to one another. We're walking in life together. He said, for this task, there's going to be men. Give us seven men. These men need to have good reputations. They need to be blameless, we see in 1 Timothy 3. These men need to be filled with the Spirit. These are men who are not operating according to human wisdom. Well, I'm really good at my job. I'll come into the church and I'll straighten things. No, they seek the Lord. They read the Scripture and they say, I see what God has done in the past and I expect Him to do it now, here. Give us those kind of men. They're men of wisdom. These are individuals that could go into homes and, and minister to these widows and be sensitive to how they speak to them and care for them and, and minister to them and, and not be insensitive and, and meet their need and truly shepherd them. So the responsibility was delegated. So we're going to appoint this duty. We're going to commit this to them. And then we're not going to stand over them at every point like, no, 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 shouldn't do it that way. No, 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 I like that. Now, if I was doing it, well, you want to do it then? Appoint them to the task. You work it out. We trust you. Take care of these women for this need. This is what Matt Smethurst says. He says, and I, I've shared this before, given the root problem pay, facing the seven, we can conclude that deacons should be those who muffle shockwaves, not make them reverberate further. They are persons with fine-tuned conflict radars. They love solutions more than drama and rise to respond in creatively constructive ways to promote the harmony of the whole. Hey, there's a need. How can we step in and take care of that need? But the primary task of the pastoral leaders would remain be devoted to the word. We'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That is my desire. That is our desire as elders. I am absolutely grateful for the opportunity and the joy of serving this people and you enable me to be able to be devoted to the word and devoted to prayer and shepherding. Drove bus for quite a long time. 
because it was an inreach to the community and it helped to supplement. And the Lord is orchestrated in so many ways. But the rest that I get now, it's, it's important. As we look at this, we've, we've said this before, elders lead ministry from Jamie Dunlop, deacons facilitate ministry, and congregation, they do the work of the ministry. That's the joy. It's a joy to serve the Lord. So why would church leadership hold it all in and it's only us? And you would miss out on the blessing. So don't hear calls to serve as, ah. Oh. Like you're invited to serve the good and gracious king you just sang to and about. He wants to use you as his plan A. Just think about that. Pastoral ministry must be characterized by prayer and by ministering the word to the people of God. This is your, it's mine too, this is our greatest need. So when I have time to invest into the word of God and prepare, then I bring a meal that is a spiritual meal and it feeds our souls together. It grows us as a people and we are experiencing the work, the fruit of the working of God's word in our hearts and lives. I'm watching it day by day and week by week and year by year. And it strengthens me and I see it. I, I experience it, it's strengthening you. It is the joy of my life. Number four, the congregation must strive together for unity. That strife, strive is, it's a fight, but it's not fighting each other. It's fighting for each other. It's fighting with each other. It's drawing near together. The congregation, they heard the plan that came from the apostles. They were included in the plan. They just weren't run over. Just think about it. The apostles, they were, they'd been in prison. They'd been beaten. They could have gone and just thrashed those widows. Couldn't they? We were the ones in prison. You weren't. And all you want is food. Oh, come on, people. They didn't do that. No, they need to eat. It isn't right. How did this happen? I don't know, but it did. How do we better care for them? So, hey, everybody, family meeting, let's get together. There's a group of ladies that we love dearly, and we haven't been showing them this love. Whether we said you were loved at the end or not, they aren't feeling it because they're not getting food the way they should be. Let's fix it. Here's the plan. You pray about it. You give us seven. Here's the kind of men you give to us. They bring those seven, and then they appoint them to the task. And the congregation says, well, that went well. That's good. That's healthy. The congregation received the plan. They were all led of the Spirit. They worked together to solve this conflict, to solve this problem. And then they give the seven men, Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, all these guys would have been connected to these Hellenistic widows from that background. Like, well, who would better care for them than guys who know them and love them? They'd meet that need. And we'll strengthen you for this task. Only Stephen and Philip are mentioned elsewhere. These guys were evangelists. They were men who could handle the word well. Congregation set the men before the apostles. We don't know how the congregation chose them, but they did. It doesn't really matter how they chose them. It mattered to them, but not to us. The point is, they were given the responsibilities. They met it. They brought the seven men. And so we don't have, here's how you go about choosing those who serve in the church, except make sure that those who serve are men and women of character, depending on the role that they serve in. They're our character listen to me our character is way more important than our capabilities our competency all of the things that we can do that is all subservient to who are we what kind of people are we you take a a guy like we read about here and if they weren't the greatest at serving a meal it didn't matter because they were men full of the spirit full of wisdom and they would figure it out 
that is true for us as well. So often, even in churches, it's the way it is in the corporate world. If somebody's talented and successful and highly skilled, they advance. Promote them, promote them, promote them. Yeah, but you know they're unethical. That's all right. They do really good in sales. <laughs> okay, watch out. In the church, integrity is so important. And so as we live together, we walk together in small group, we grow that. We're intentional about that in these environments. These men were ordained to ministry. They set them, verse 6 says, before the apostles. They prayed on over them. They laid their hands on them. Why would they pray over them? Because there's something symbolic saying, you can't do this on your own. Every time we've laid hands on someone, when you, you guys prayed over me before going to Africa, I could feel the weight on my shoulders. It's significant. And then I show that picture in Africa, and the guy's like, whoa. Whoa. There's something happening there that people realize you belong to them. They sent you to us. So it's not just you speaking. You're connected to that group, and that group loves us, and we've never met any of them. And who's that little girl up there with you, right? Remember that picture? Like, how'd she get in there? Ah, she just welcomed. She just came right up there and joined in in the prayer. This is, this is the work of God. Number five, the gospel will advance. And it won't just creep along. It won't just trickle along. When a church is gospel-centered, Christ-centered, mission-minded, when we see these kind of things happening, the gospel will advance mightily. The word of God will spread I'll tell you, when this church called me to serve, and I've had a commitment for a long time, my whole, my whole life in ministry, I've been committed to the Word of God. Have I been as effective in communicating the Word of God? Absolutely not. But I've been committed to the Word of God. That was one of the prayers, and I've shared this with you before, when we prayed about where we were going after the job ended at Sterling Heights. Lord, give us a place that loves your Word, that will love us for who we are. At that time, we were four. Love us for who we are, not for, well, our first pastor, this pastor, the other pastor. G give, a, give us a flock that will love us. And then a heart for the world. Those were the three things we prayed for. Came here, began preaching the word. We've gone Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. That's pretty much our pattern of just teaching the word. And I've heard it pretty much all my life. You teach the word, you provide the depth, and God will provide the breadth. That's what I've heard for decades. And I hear it, but for many years, I, I, but I didn't see it. I haven't experienced it yet. I know it to be true. I believe it to be true. It, it's, it's biblical and we are experiencing God do the work, but it's not a flash in the pan work. It's not microwave ministry. It's not just, poof, there it is, big church that all the people left the other churches and went and joined that church. No, no, no. This is the work of God, and this is our desire. Lord, take your word that you promised will never return void, and you'll send it wherever you want to send it. Take the word and put it through, whether it be through the internet or through sharing on, on messages on social media or you sharing with coworkers and family. And there are people that are now receiving the word around the country and around the world. And the Lord will bless his word not the ideas of men. My stories, my ideas, pff, forget all of them. The word of God, remember that. Remember that. This is what MacArthur said. He said the church today needs organization for the same reasons as the first fellowship. Pastors must be freed to focus on the preaching of the word and prayer. Better organization can help meet the needs of all members and thus avoid conflict. And, an, and a unified, well-taught church will be a powerful witness to the lost world. Do you believe that? I do. 
And I am thankful to the Lord to be seeing that happen in this congregation. So the word of God will spread. We see that. And disciples will multiply. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. This is where the heart of ministry is. We don't just replace ourselves in ministry. We replicate ourselves in ministry. Replacing yourself is corporate. I was the CEO, now somebody else is the CEO. I was the supervisor, now somebody else is the supervisor. I retired, I go on to, I got promoted, I, I retired, I'm out. Ministry is replicate. Some of you remember the, you're old enough to remember the triplicate forms that had the carbon paper. And if you had to replicate it a significant number of times, what did it mean? You had to press harder. I, gotta get, I don't want to write this same thing five, ten times, so press hard to replicate it all the way down. Ministry is replicating. And this is important for a church to grow. It's opening rightly the doors in ministry, not smothering and suffocating a ministry that I do, this is mine. That's ownership, and we don't want any of it. Stewardship. Stewardship is... It's not mine. This pulpit isn't mine. This congregation, you're not mine, except by way of stewardship. I don't own you. Jesus owns you. So I want to serve you, and I want you to serve the Lord and one another the way that rightly reflects Jesus, that honors Jesus. And if we do this together, what do you think is going to happen? I want what the Lord has given and is giving to us. I want it for every marriage and family in our community and region. And right now, we don't have the room to receive it. But we're working on that. And and we're moving forward in wisdom. And the Lord will provide. But let's make disciples and let's multiply. So whatever ministry is entrusted to you, Are you multiplying? Are you replicating yourself in that? That's small group leaders. Hey, I know it's tough when we go and we multiply small groups. You're like, that's my group and that's my people and we do this and that and we have all these funny, unique things and if you show up, you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Time to multiply. Because if we stay too long together as a holy huddle, then somebody new comes in like, I don't know what's going on. I guess you had to be there. And that is the wrong mentality and approach and philosophy for making disciples, and multiplying ministry. This is what happened, and this is what we pray will happen. The word will spread, disciples will multiply, and let her see, enemies of the gospel will become not just friends. There were priests who hated them. There were priests who mocked them. There were priests who were responsible for the death of their Lord and Savior, Jesus, And they laid down their weapons against the gospel and submitted to Christ, and they became family. That's all the way in to joint heirs with Christ. Brother, sister, brother, you used to be in the temple and you were a priest, and now you're here and you're worshiping Jesus with us. And maybe you were one that was saying, crucify him, crucify him. And now you're saying, I'm waiting for him to return. And every eye will see him. And I long for that day. And I don't fear that day anymore. I look forward to that day because he's forgiven me. And he has washed away all my sin. And he's brought me all the way in from enemy and a and a total insurrectionist and committed treason against him to a son, a daughter. A lot of times in Scripture, it will use the term sons because in this generation, sons were the only ones who could get the inheritance. And if you belong to Christ, whether you are Jew, Gentile, male, female, whatever your ethnicity, if you're in Christ, You're in the family, and you are a joint heir with Christ. (laughs) Hallelujah. So this is what we can expect. There's five. So as you look at these on the screen, haven't we experienced God's blessing here at Grace? You're experiencing this. We praise the Lord for all who have heard and received the gospel, and we're praying for those. And even today, there's people praying right now for someone who hasn't believed the gospel. They haven't responded to the gospel yet that today would be their day of salvation. Can we give 
the Lord prays for every single one of the attacks that Satan has tried to derail this church. Years and years ago, someone left telling Richard Dixon, oh, this church won't make it without me. This is a long time ago. And Richard said, well, Matthew chapter, right? The Lord said, I'll build my church. And it didn't have a little asterisk C down except for John Doe. You know, if he, if he leaves, oh, it's over. No, no, the Lord will build his church. And we have seen the Lord do, give us victory. Continue to pray for the elders. Continue to pray for those who lead in ministry that we will be forward in wisdom. Church, strive together for unity. That God would use your hand in the work of the gospel, that we follow Christ together, and then we have this expectation that isn't out there somewhere. It's real for us. Lord, we expect your gospel to advance mightily, and here I am, use me. Use me. Use us. Isn't that our heart's desire? Will you stand with me? Lord, you are a good and gracious king, and we humbly bow in your presence. Even in our posture of prayer is significant that we're just bowed before you. There's a reverence. There's an acknowledgement even in our posture that you are worthy to be worshipped. You are worthy to be served because you are great and you are kind and you are gracious and you are love. Thank you for loving me despite my sin. Thank you for coming to me and convicting me of my sin and saving my soul. And I thank you on behalf of everyone here that can say that. That's my prayer too. You saved me. And we intercede for those who do not know you yet as Lord and Savior that you would, by your sovereign grace and power, by your spirit, open their eyes to see the goodness of Jesus, to see the glory of Jesus, to see the grace of Jesus, that they would surrender their lives, confessing their sin and confessing you, Lord, as Savior and God. Oh, Father, may that happen today. Use us for your glory and the good of the gospel for all peoples. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and King and Savior, and all God's people said, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved. <laughs>